the Chinese Communist Party. They're the biggest threat to democracies around the world. Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe is sounding the alarm on the threat China poses to the United States. Having Chinese 5G technology in the U.S. is a real security risk. China is using mobile technology as a tool for spying. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the Clean Network Program on August 5th, aimed at stopping the CCP's aggressive intrusions through telecommunications and the Internet. The tide is turning toward trusted 5G vendors and against Huawei, as citizens around the world are waking up to the danger of the Chinese Communist Party's surveillance state. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Every day we hear about the growing threat of the Chinese Communist Party to the free world. It is my distinct pleasure to bring to you a man who has figured out how to counter that threat. Keith Kroc is the U.S. State Department's former Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. And he is also the embodiment of the American dream. Hailing from a small town in Ohio from modest means, Undersecretary Kroc is hailed as a transformational leader in multiple sectors. Join me now. Undersecretary Keith Kroc, it's really my personal honor to have you with me on Global Perspectives. Well, Ellie, it's great to be with you, and uh, I really look forward to this. I had the honor of meeting you because you were the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment for the Trump administration. So I wanted to start our interview by asking you, What's your advice to young Americans as they hope to achieve their dreams in the way that you clearly have achieved your dreams and I know are achieving more and more every single day? I'm really humbled by that. You know, I think, uh, I guess the best advice I would, I would give to, you know, the transformational leaders of tomorrow would be don't be afraid to jump in water your, over your head. Um, and get outside that uh, comfort zone. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you might feel like you're going to drown, but you're going to learn how to swim. And after a while, uh, you know, I kind of call it scary fun. Um, you know, after a while, it kind of becomes addicting, you know, that adrenaline rush, um, because the most important things in life aren't, aren't written in a book. And you've got to get bloodied on the battlefield. I guess maybe the last piece of advice I give is that uh, ego is your enemy and humility is your friend. And a good sense of humor is a superpower. Well, I, you know, that's just, just a, a lot of incredible advice. I'd love to turn our conversation to um, what many of us understand to be the greatest threat to the United States and to freedom worldwide, which is the Chinese Communist Party. Um, you wrote recently in the National Interest, along with Brigadier General David Stilwell, you wrote the following, quote, the reason we agreed to serve at the U.S. Department of State was because, despite our vastly different careers, we saw the CCP's growing global authoritarian ambition for what it is, the evolution of China's market competition over the last few years into a form of techno-economic aggression by General Secretary Xi Jinping. Can you tell us a little bit what you meant by that? Yeah, you know, uh, Ellie, I think the reality that we face as a nation and, and, and the free world is one of ever increasing uh, cyber warfare with seemingly ceaseless intense variations of weaponized economic competition. And the CCP is playing the long game, they're playing for keeps, they're playing a game of four-dimensional military, diplomatic, economic, and cultural chess with little respect uh, for sovereignty of nations, uh, for property, for the environment, for human rights, uh, and for rule of law. We believe in a free market here in the United States, but when somebody comes in the market and no longer plays by the rules, the market is no longer free. And it goes from a free market to a fool's market. 
Yes, and, and in your work as the undersecretary for the U.S. State Department, um, you clearly addressed uh, the Chinese not playing fair as, as you're describing it right now. And the Wall Street Journal called your work on the clean network, quote, an undisputed success and perhaps, quote, the most enduring foreign policy legacy of the last four years, so much so that the Harvard Business School is actually now teaching about that work. Can you please share for our audience what the clean network um, work was that you did and why everyone should care about it? The, the mission became very, very urgent uh, just a little over a year ago in February of 2020 when it looked like uh, the Chinese Communist Party's master plan to control 5G uh, was going to come into reality. And both sides were hitting the panic. Both sides of the aisle were hitting the panic button on this um, because their national champion, Huawei, uh, which is their most important company and the backbone for their surveillance state and the company that enables uh, punishable genocide in Xinjiang, for example, uh, it looked like they were going to run the table. They had just announced 91 uh, 5G deals around the world, 47 were in Europe. It looked like they were going to uh, run that table. So when and, and all the U.S. efforts up to that point had been failing. Um, and so when we got the responsibilities for that, uh, Ellie, uh, basically, we did a couple things that, uh, you know, we would naturally do in the business world. And I brought and when I came in as undersecretary of state, I brought brought in 12 private sector, uh, most of them from Silicon Valley, results that oriented execs, technologists and entrepreneurs. The State Department said, hey, that's really never been done. And uh, for us, the second nature was, hey, you know, the efforts were failing because the United States was going around pounding the table saying, don't buy Huawei. And we said, you know, why don't we treat um, these countries and the telcos like customers and come up with a value proposition? And and that's what we did. And so this clean uh, network alliance of democracy it ended up to be 60 countries representing two thirds of the world's global GDP, 200 telcos, a whole host of industry leading clean companies. And it was this that took those 91 5G deals and reversed their momentum and down to probably less than a couple dozen. And it's really the first government led initiative that actually tangibly uh, defeated China Inc. And so that was able to prove that China Inc. is beatable. And it also exposed their biggest weakness, which is lack of trust. And uh, an undersecretary, I think that uh, so that our audience really understands the significance of 5G. If I if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that it really affects every aspect of our modern contemporary lives. We really couldn't function without it. And the Chinese were about to uh, own it and have complete global dominance before your work at the State Department in which you succeeded in convincing other countries not to buy their tech. You're, you're absolutely right. It would have been an absolute disaster. You know, one of the things we did is we, as we would go around talking to different countries and, and different um, uh, companies and telcos, we would say, who are you going to trust with your citizens' uh, personal data? Who are you going to trust with your company's proprietary technology? And who are you going to trust with uh, your, your, your government's most precious information? You know, the interesting thing, Ellie, was, um, you know, in my first 60 bilaterals that I had, uh, with my foreign counterparts, economic ministers, finance ministers, foreign ministers. Um, you know, I'd be with them and I'd say, um, how's your relationship with China? And they would go, well, you know, they're pretty important. And then they would like kind of look both ways and lean in and go, but we don't trust them. And that rang bells in my head because trust is the most important word in any language. You do business with people you trust, you partner with people you trust, there'd be no business uh, without trust. And 5G is all about the trust business. And, uh, and nobody uh, trusts the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and the other thing that I could clearly see was that 
you know, everybody was terrified of their intimidation, retaliation, and retribution. And so what the Clean Network did is it provided a, cert a security blanket against that retaliation. Well, and it's interesting that you bring up retaliation because clearly the Chinese Communist Party did not like your successes in countering them. In fact, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping placed you on, you personally on a sanctions list. How did it feel to be sanctioned by the Chinese? Well, um, look, I was serving my country, Ellie, and I did my job. I didn't get sanctioned because of what I said. Uh, I got sanctioned uh, and my family for the results that our team uh, achieved. In a way, it's a badge of honor, um, but look, it was really, really important work and uh, I was serving my country, you know, uh, and what a great honor it was for me to pay back uh, a nation that's given so much to my family and to me. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I know that uh, not not at your level, I was just a deputy envoy, but um, I feel exactly the same. You know, it's the honor and privilege of the lifetime to be able to give back to America, the greatest country on earth. And so I, I really share that with you. Um, I want to bring us to some of the work that you're doing today. So just recently, you helped launch the Center for Tech Diplomacy at your alma mater at Purdue University. The center describes itself as, quote, America's first tech tank, and that it is an independent think tank at the intersection of technology and U.S. foreign policy. Tell us, Under Secretary Kroc, why you felt that this center was necessary. Is it addressing work that you don't think is otherwise being addressed or issues, I should say? Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we were able to uh, develop, uh, in essence, almost invent was uh, technology statecraft. And this is something that uh, is not taught at the State Department or the Treasury or Trade or the DOD or Commerce. This is really, really important stuff because the battleground uh, with the Chinese Communist Party uh, is technology. And so the whole purpose uh, behind the Center for Technology Diplomacy at Purdue is to advance freedom uh, through trusted technology. And this is critical to ensure global economic security and technology uh, security around the world, global technology security. Well, and, and incredibly enough, um, just this week, as you and I talk, the Chinese apparently surprised the United States with the testing of a hypersonic missile. Um, would you mind sharing with our audience a little bit about, you know, what that means for the U.S. and and uh, how, how could we have been caught by surprise with such a test? Yeah, well, uh, we shouldn't have been caught surprised. I think we've known about their hypersonics and, and these are, is a very dangerous weapon and it's very, very hard to defend against. Um, so this is serious, serious uh, weaponry. Now, Purdue just got a $550 million grant from Rolls-Royce to do uh, research on hypersonics and also development manufacturing. So we're catching up, but this is a dangerous, you know, this is a dangerous uh, weapon. Over the last 40 years, uh, you know, we've done much to enable China. We really believe that uh, capitalism would equal democracy. And uh, they proved us wrong on that. And if you think about it, um, if you think about uh, the trust principles that we use in the clean network, which are things like integrity, accountability, reciprocity, transparency, respect for rule of law, respect for property, respect for sovereignty, human rights, the environment, the press, uh, those are things that we honor. And those are things that China doesn't honor. So, Ellie, if I'm competing against you and I can steal your intellectual property and I can use slave labor and I can use coal fired power plants and I, I don't have to respect the law or I am the law, I'm going to win every time. And see, the beauty of the clean network was 
that we took those trust principles and in one jujitsu move, we flipped China on their back and we used that against them for our economic advantage instead of theirs. So in essence, we weaponized the very principles that protect our freedom. To, to answer your question, clearly, clearly it's not a fair competition. And, and, you know, I agree with you. I think it's time for, for everyone in the United States, whether it's our lawmakers, our, our elected officials, uh, those who are in the administration and your average American, we all need to understand that it's not a fair competition. The CCP is not playing by the rules. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I could see uh, in my last year at the State Department, as we traveled around, you know, 50 countries, for example, last fall, is I could see citizens of the world waking up to the Chinese Communist Party's, I call it their three C's doctrine of concealment, co-option, and coercion. And citizens of the world could see that the pandemic is a result of the concealment of the virus and that the co-option of Hong Kong has eviscerated all of its citizens' freedoms. And the coercion in Xinjiang has grown to punishable genocide. And you know, the citizens don't like it. Now that's, begin, that's begun to give the political will to government leaders and the corporate CEOs to stand up uh, to that China bully. And it is probably the most unifying issue on uh, bipartisan issue on Capitol Hill. What I'd love to do now is also um, turn our conversation to uh, a different project, um, a subject that you and I worked on together, uh, which touched my heart personally. Um, and that was um, our, our op-ed that we wrote together about what's taking place in China today, which is the actual genocide of Uyghur Muslims. In that piece, you and I discussed how the State Department had determined that the Chinese Communist Party is actually committing genocide. Would you please share with our audience what, what the State Department process was and what the definition means? and and what you think our audience can do to, uh, to help the Uyghurs today. Yeah, sure. You know, I remember uh, a year ago, last July 4th, I, I mean, I went on broadcast TV and I talked about it and I called it genocide. And yeah, we used the definition uh, that the United Nations uh, uses. So there's no question about that. And Ellie, I really, I learned a lot from you and I really appreciate it working with you um, on that op-ed, because the fact of the matter is, there's over a million Uyghurs that are going through uh, ethnic uh, genocide and cultural genocide uh, over there. And it is sh shockingly reminiscent of the Holocaust, right? And, and uh, you know, when you look at these images trickling out of there, uh, China, it shows rows and rows of shaved and shackled Uyghurs kneeling on the ground and waiting to be jammed on the trains and transported to concentration camps against China. There's about 380 of them. And it's just like the Jews were shipped uh, to labor and death camp by the Nazis. Exactly and, right. And, and that's why, Undersecretary, um, I felt so personally obliged to partner with you because, uh, you know, as Jews and as someone who served as, a, as an envoy to combat anti-Semitism, one of the things that we're so careful about is not comparing the Holocaust to anything other than an actual genocide. And, and this is what's taking place in China today. It, re it really is. And, you know, um, when we say never again, we've got to mean it. And I think that was the whole point. And, and you know, there's action to be taken here from uh, across society, you know, for the business community. Uh, you know, what we say out here in Silicon Valley is corporate responsibility is social responsibility. And so it's why are we financing these companies that enable the CCP's uh, genocide? And, you know, there's a lot of people who've really turned their head on this thing. And it really is reminiscent. Um, so uh, this and, and you know, uh, I think the biggest way to impact, uh, you know, China on this, Ellie, as you and I wrote about, is that is to hit them where it counts, hit them in the wallet, um, because we we are uh, 
unknowingly financing uh, these companies. Well, and I have to say, uh, again, as a Jew, that um, every year at, at Holocaust Remembrance uh, ceremonies, we say never again. And so it really, you know, we have to mean it when we say never again. And, and this, is, this is the moment uh, that we all have to really stand up and, and really, you know, um, bring our humanity to light by, by standing up against the Chinese Communist Party and really fighting for the sake of the Uyghurs who, who are having this uh, horrible genocide uh, committed against them. And, uh, and Under Secretary, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I wonder if people imagine the depth of the Chinese threat um, to my mind, what I hear about the way that the CCP conducts um, it, the governance of its own people is really how we could imagine what it is that they're trying to do to the world. And, and I just wonder if you could help shed, shed light on it, because I, I wonder if my audience could really understand how deep this threat is, unless they understand what kind of a government the Chinese are to their own people. So maybe you could just tell our audience a bit about that. Sure. It, it, I mean, it's a total dictatorship. And uh, it's even getting much more aggressive. Total surveillance. Um, and, and, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has no regard for human life. They really have really only two goals. One is regime preservation, and the other is global world domination. They believe it's the rightful place in history to be the Middle Kingdom, where all roads uh, lead to Beijing. So if, if they're the biggest uh, threat to democracies around the world. And, and you know, what they're, what they're out there and what they've been doing for the last uh, 40 years is doing all kinds of things from entangling supply chains to conflicting uh, uh, politicians, business people, those kind of things for their uh, advantage. And their goal is that by 2049 or the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, that they're the global dominant superpower. now. She, uh, uh, General Secretary Xi, has accelerated that timetable. We could see that during the pandemic. Under Secretary, I have to ask you something. Do you, do you think indeed the political will exists in the United States and, and even internationally to, to stop the Chinese Communist Party from global world domination? Well, uh, here's what I think. I see it growing because what I've seen before my very eyes is people waking up. Are we there yet? We're not there yet. The world's gonna, is gonna wake up. The question is, can we do it soon enough? It's time to take off our rose-colored glasses instead of treat them how we hope they'd be, treat them how they truly are. Well, well, I couldn't agree with you more. And so this just brings me to my last question, which is, you know, here you are, uh, as I described earlier, an incredibly successful uh, entrepreneur. You I mean, you've made it. You are the American dream. And here you are fighting um, probably the most uh, evil world power today. Can I ask what motivates you to, to take on this fight rather than, let's say, enjoying life? Well, uh... I reckon uh, it's those five kids of mine and, and, and you know, hopefully some, a lot of grandchildren because uh, I really had a chance to see. I mean, I went to uh, serve in the State Department because of China. And what I saw was beyond my imagination. And, and I know that this threat is real. And I want to make sure that my children and the world's children have a chance to live in a free society and have a chance to live like I got to live the American dream. I mean, I, you know, I started off as a welder when I was 12 years old in my dad's little five person machine shop. But so I want everybody uh, to have that chance. And that that really motivates me. I'm also really competitive and I and, and I see how bad uh, 
the CCP is and no regard for human life. So I'm a competitor and, and, and we proved to him we can, we can beat him. I think, you know, one of the most important things uh, I think about our transformational diplomacy in the State Department is that it gives people hope that yes, the CCP is beatable um, as long as we stand together. Well, um, as an immigrant to the United States, uh, you know, I feel my life has been a testament to all that is good in this country and uh, just the privilege that it is to live under freedom. Under Secretary Keith Kroc, it's really been an honor. Thank you so much for, having, for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you so much, Ellie. A surveillance state with complete disregard for human life that is committing genocide against a religious minority and aims for absolute global domination. That is what we, all of us, you and me, our children and our grandchildren face with the Chinese Communist Party threat. Former Undersecretary Keith Kroc believes the world is waking up to this threat. I'm so grateful to have a man like Keith Kroc fighting this fight on behalf of humanity. I also believe it's time for all of us to jump into this battlefield. Thanks so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.